Recall the law of the excluded middle. A given well-formed logical statement is either true or false. There's no hole in the middle. Put another way, any statement P is either true or P is not true. Alternatively, P is false. The law of the excluded middle suggests a proof strategy variously called proof by contradiction or indirect proof. The idea is simple. Let's consider any claim P. It might appear that there are three possibilities. P could be true, P could be false, alternatively not P is true. The third possibility that neither P nor not P is true has already been eliminated by the law of the excluded middle. So to prove P, assume that not P is true. Derive a contradiction that proves that not P is false. In other words, not not P is true. So we've ruled out one of the remaining two options. So P has to be true. We can describe an argument of this sort rigorously using the standard rules of inference. We assume a compound premise uh, we'll call C that is simply the, uh, the and of whatever set of premises we actually want to use. We want to prove that from C, this compound premise, we can derive P. So here's a possible structure for our proof. We assume C. We now conditionally assume not P, the negation of the thing we want to prove. We reason, and at some point, some number of steps later, we derive not C, that our original set of premises has to be false. Then we use conditional discharge, and we derive the claim that not P implies not C. To make that a little easier to use, let's use contrapositive and turn that into C implies P. Using modus ponens now, since we have C from 1, we can derive P. And now that we've seen why an argument of this sort is valid, we can write more concise proofs that leave out a few of these steps. Let's see what we really need. Particularly in the case of proofs in mathematics, we don't start by writing down everything we already know. We'll appeal to the definitions and other theorems as we need them. We do need to assert the assumption not P, and then we need to do our reasoning and derive a contradiction. We can skip the next two steps since they simply transform what we already know, so we can just go immediately to the conclusion we've proved P. Let's do an example. Let x and y be positive reals. We want to prove that for any such x and y, the square root of x plus the square root of y is greater than the square root of the quantity x plus y. We start by assuming that our claim is false. In other words, that the square root of x plus the square root of y is less than or equal to the square root of x plus y. We square both sides. We subtract x plus y from both sides. We again square both sides. So now we have the claim that 4xy is less than or equal to 0. But we note that in order for that to be true, at least 1 of x or y would have to be less than or equal to 0. But that contradicts our initial claim that both of them are positive. So our assumption that our desired claim is false must be false. And we've proved our claim. By the way, let's look at a non-proof of the same claim. Sometimes people think, well, why to prove some claim P do we have to bother assuming not P and deriving a contradiction? Why can't we just assume P and derive something true? So we begin by assuming our desired claim, not its negation. In this case, just a single symbol is different. We assume that the square root of x plus the square root of y is greater than the square root of x plus y. Now we can use the same algebraic steps that we used in the actual proof. Square both sides, subtract x plus y, and square again. We've now derived the claim that 4xy is greater than 0. And we know that that must be true since both x and y are greater than 0. So far, everything we've done is valid. The problem is that we don't have a useful proof. What we have is a proof that if our assumption is true, then 4xy is greater than 0. But we already knew that 4xy was greater than 0. 
What we don't have is a proof that the square root of x plus the square root of y is greater than the square root of x plus y. We have a proof that if that claim is true, then it's true. But that's just a tautology that doesn't prove anything new. It's important to remember, we can't prove that a claim p is true by assuming that it is, although doing that is a common mistake.